Today, I want to talk to you guys about an algorithm that keeps showing up. No matter what I do, this algorithm finds me. When I was doing my PhD and I was tracking vortices in 3D, I wanted to use this algorithm to more efficiently find the vortex cores. A few weeks ago when I was making my terminal game, I wanted to use this algorithm in order to create an interesting animation. When I was playing video games with my girlfriend last weekend, in particular two-player Minesweeper but also Go, this algorithm appeared in both of them. And this algorithm is, somewhat surprisingly, Floodfill. Most of you guys probably know Floodfill as Bucketfill, which is what you would typically call it if you were using some sort of art program like GIMP. It's essentially this little bucket icon. What it does is when you click the interior of some domain, it fills the contents of this domain. Here we basically fill from the center to the extents of the circle. And this kind of gives you an intuition as to how it works. So now I want to talk to you guys about how exactly you flood fill. There's basically two parts to this method. The first part is finding the extents of the domain that you want to fill. The second part is then filling that domain. We'll talk about the first part first. Essentially, let's go back to that circle, but we're going to make it like really, really low resolution so you can see the pixels. Here we have three basic domains. One is in the center of the circle, another is the circle itself, and the last one is the outside of the circle, right? The idea is if you were going to fill any of these domains, essentially you would fill region 1, 2, or 3, but you wouldn't bleed into the other domains. This is important for discussing what a domain actually is defined as, right? So here we're going to define a domain as any set of connected elements that share the same value. Now, in principle, when we say they share the same value, there could be some sort of threshold where we fill all elements that are close enough, and that's totally fair. We're not going to discuss how to find the exact threshold here or anything like that. Instead, we're just going to define the domain as any set of connected elements with the same value. Now let's talk about the next bit, which is somehow way, way more interesting, and that is filling the domain. Like we said before, the domain is considered to be a set of connected elements. So if we consider it to be a set of connected elements, it creates some sort of graph where we have each individual element with a neighbor left, right, up, and down. And then those neighbors, again, have further neighbors left, right, up, and down, creating a connected graph like so. Now, when you look at graphs and you ask yourself the question, how exactly do we fill these graphs? The first thing that most people think of is some sort of graph traversal, which we talked about before with tree traversal. And we know there's two basic ways in which you can do it. One is via depth first and another is via breadth first traversal. So let's talk about them each individually. First, depth first traversal. This is in some ways the easiest way to traverse a tree because you're just doing basic recursion. The idea is you start at some initial point and then you go down one branch and cover all of the elements there before going down the next branch and the next branch as shown in the animation there. Now, one thing I want to point out here is that this particular version for depth first traversal that we show here on the left is essentially a very straightforward recursive implementation. You could also do the same thing with a stack. The main thing here is again, what I said before, you're going to go down as far as you can one direction before going around that area and filling those elements around the end of that branch. So for example, if we're going to do some sort of depth first traversal over our connected graph that we drew before, we're going to go as far down to the left or the right or up or down as we can before filling out those elements from there. And this is going to look something like this. We go as far to the left as we can, and then we just kind of fill in the area. Now watching this animation, it's actually kind of interesting because we missed that one point over here but we still fill in the entire area and then we come back to it later. Now let's talk about the other method, which is somehow more intuitive. The idea here is that we go through our tree or our connected graph in a breadth first fashion. So we go through all of one level before going through all of the next level and all of the next level. Now in principle, this is more intuitive. It's how you would naturally count going through this graph. But on the other hand, the code is somehow more complicated because now instead of being able to write your code recursively, you need some sort of external data structure like a queue. Now, again, we said before that you could do the depth first with a stack and it's very similar to the code you see here. But the most important part here is that you do need some sort of queue to do this type of traversal. What does it look like if we do the full connected graph with flood fill? Well, it looks like this. And you just go through all of the elements and fill it out from the center out to the edges. Here, you don't really miss an element, but there's something kind of tricky about this fill that you wouldn't naturally think of. Let's go ahead and think about how we would fill this set of elements, starting with the very center. What I would naturally do is I would take that center point and I would look left, right, up, and down, and then I would 
figure out what the set of neighbors were, and then move to the set of neighbors before coloring it. So the idea is the first step is to again find the neighbors, and the next step is to move to the neighbors and color. Well, okay, that's rather straightforward. The first step, we connect these four, and we then go through each one individually and color them. So what's going to happen when we visit those nodes? Let's start by going to the right. When we visit the right elements, what we're going to do is we're going to enqueue three more neighbors, up, down, and again further to the right. Now notably, we're just enqueuing these neighbors. We haven't yet filled them. We're just getting them ready to be filled. And at this point, we've only filled the center point and this point over here to the right. So now let's go up. As we go up, well, okay, we've now colored the up element and we've enqueued three more neighbors, left, right, and up. But there's a problem here. The left element here has already been enqueued, but not yet colored. And because it wasn't colored, it was then enqueued twice. If we go through this entire set of elements, we find that there are now four elements here that have been enqueued, but not yet colored, and thus they have been basically double counted by this method. So the solution here is to do something that wasn't exactly obvious to me at the time of implementation, which is why I'm actually describing it here in this video. What you need to do is color the elements as you enqueue them. Basically, when you find that this neighbor is available for coloring, you color it at that instance. And what this will do is it will create a new graph of connected elements, where, for example, you don't have these elements that are connected twice. This element here, for example, is no longer connected to this element here. And the reason for that is by the time you get to this element here, this element has already been colored. And so that's kind of cool. Here we create a new graph where essentially only one of the neighbors has three neighbors and the other ones have two neighbors and the one has one neighbor. And this optimally colors the graph. Now, like I said before, there are plenty of really interesting things you can do with flood fill. Here, we're just showing the filling of two regions and saying there are two different ways to do it. And depending on what you want to do, it could be more or less optimal, right? One thing I want to point out here, though, is that, yeah, sure, you could have these two separate implementations, but actually there are way, way more implementations than just these two. In fact, we could flood the algorithm archive with flood fill methods, and there would still be way more left to do. This is one of those problems that has been majorly over-optimized because there are so many applications. So one thing that we did just for fun is we actually filled a maze using flood fill. The idea is that we have some sort of start point and some sort of finish point there, and we just flood starting at that start point until we get to the end. Basically, there are a bunch of really, really interesting applications to flood fill, but for now, we have a full chapter on flood fill available in the algorithm archive describing everything that we talked about in this video and a bit more. And again, we'll cover the other methods as they come up. I just didn't want to put them all together right now. I wanted to kind of wait a second before I put the next algorithm up. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching. There are links in the description for GitHub, GitHub sponsors, Twitch, and Discord. Feel free to check them out if you're interested. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next time.